Welcome, I'm Kyle Allred, and I'm happy to be joined again by one of the world's leading immunologists and vaccine experts, Professor Shane Crotty. I wanna ask you about uh, the mutations because these have been getting so much attention in the news and people are worried about them. Could you first just describe the landscape of these mutations and the variants that have been discovered and then what that could mean for vaccines? The virus is constantly mutating, and that's that. That is a normal thing for for viruses, um, and and I think as as we discussed last time, what's a pretty common thing to happen is what happens in the case of say polio and measles, where the virus will will mutate over time, um, but not in ways that can escape the immune system. Um, uh, because the immune response is is essentially broad enough, and and the virus has uh, uh, only certain ways it can mutate and still be a functional virus, uh, and so that's why the the polio vaccine works still today, seventy years later, um, and the measles vaccine works today, still you know something like seventy years later, because they're still recognizing the same virus. The exact sequence of the virus has changed over time, but. Um, it's still it's still seen by the immune system in, in largely the same way. Now, SARS-2 is a new virus, um, uh, and, and there's certainly a lot of concern about how it's going to behave uh, over time. Um, one of the things that's been observed, let's say, up through November, okay, um, there were lots of lots of thousands of individual variants that had been observed um, and and the changes people are most concerned about are in the uh, the spike protein which is what the antibodies recognize and then particularly the RBD domain of the spike protein which is which is what uh, the majority of the neutralizing antibodies recognize that one piece of spike and several of the viral mutants that had been seen um, that had changes had mutations in, in the RBD again up through November um, uh, really haven't been concerning um, so one of them is position 614 and that's just the number of the amino acid position in in the protein so the spike protein is like 1200 amino acids long and so uh, position 614 is uh, one specific spot uh, in that and that's the variant that swept the globe and so now that's the standard variant that's around and people have checked and uh, if you take blood samples from 100 people and ask, can those blood samples stop, can antibodies in those blood samples stop the new variant versus the old variant? Um, uh, the answer is yes. And there was really uh, overall no difference. Um, so it's a variant that made the virus uh, better in some ways. The virus uh, uh, was evolutionarily more fit, and so it, it, it has gone through the population uh, better. But it didn't change the way the immune system really recognizes the virus over overall. And so those plus a lot of other pieces of data about other variants have have largely painted a picture of, of uh, uh, yes, the virus might might change one spot or another, but but the immune system is is seeing the virus broadly enough that it doesn't matter, which is uh, <laughs> which is what I used my computer mouse for last time, right? When we talked was to say, well, you know, if if that's if that's the spike protein or if that's the RBD domain, um, if if all of your antibodies are just recognizing this one wheel, this one spot, and, and the virus mutates that one thing, well, now you're in trouble because now the immune system can't see it. But if if you've got antibodies that are recognizing all kinds of surfaces here, the fact that one piece of that surface has now changed, yes, the, those particular antibodies might not bind anymore, but, but there are uh, plenty of other antibodies that do bind, and so and so you're still you're still okay, and so that's why you, you want to see antibody responses in a number of people, something like a hundred people um, measured with an original virus and a variant virus. Do they do they look largely largely the same or not? And up through November, um, it's it's looked pretty good that the virus probably is making mutations that make the virus more evolutionarily fit. 
you know, to basically replicate in, in the respiratory tract or, or, or things like this. But, um, but the immune system's recognizing the virus in, in, in the same way. Now, there are two variants uh, that are, are major <laughs> variants of concern, uh, VOCs. So, uh, uh, so one's called the UK variant and the other is the South African variant. Um, and there are multiple different reasons that, that those are of, of concern. I think that the UK variants got a lot more data on it that it's clear at this point that that variant start being seen in the UK in something like September and it's spread in the UK much more than would have been expected by random. And so it's clearly a more fit variant uh, of, of the virus and, and it's substantially more fit. Um, it's, it's got a pretty large advantage, uh, quite a large advantage for, for spreading um, in, in the population. So that was one. And then two was that it, it had quite a few mutations at once. And so you, you, most of the time you're seeing a virus with one mutation or two mutations, and, and this one had more than a dozen mutations. Um, and so that was a particular concern because several mutations at once might escape the immune system better than, than one mutation. And, and then the South African variant is, is a similar thing, where it looks like it's spreading quite rapidly through South Africa, so it looks like it's got an evolutionary advantage, and it's got multiple mutations at, at, at the same time in, in the virus. Um, so really, those are the two that, that, that are of, of big concern. Um, and, and really, in terms of immune escape, we just don't have the data right now. Um, we're, we're still waiting to see, I, I think, what, what both the vaccine companies themselves and what a number of large labs find when they, when they do the test that I just described of taking blood samples from, from a bunch of people all at once and, and compare how well do they stop the, the new virus, the new variant versus, versus the original. And, and if it's, if it's largely the same, you know, for say 95% of the people, then then okay, it's 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 a new variant that definitely is still a concern because it's clearly spreading well, sp- spreading quickly in the population, but that the expectation would be that the um, the immune system is is still going to be good at stopping it. Oh, sorry, and I. You can take blood samples from either people who have had COVID-19 or blood samples from people who have been vaccinated, right? And both both of those groups are, are of interest. Um, and and obviously the hope is is that uh, uh, those antibodies will be good at, at stopping um, the new variants, whether it's a person who had had COVID-19 or um, or had been vaccinated. In, in all of those cases, the expectation is that T cells will still recognize these viruses because the T cells are recognizing little bits of sequence all along the genome of the virus. And, and Alex Setti's lab upstairs for me has shown now that it's a dozen helper T cell responses and a dozen killer T cell responses per person. And each person's responses are different um, because um, of uh, HLA. So the reason you and I can't swap kidneys um, is because our immune systems are different, uh, and that's that's also a way of making it harder for viruses to escape T cell pressure because it's it's different pressure in one person than than another. So so these variants aren't expected to escape uh, T cells, uh, but those the tests on the antibodies are are really pending, and and we need to see a separate but related topic is. Um, why are these viruses spreading so much more? Um, and, and, and that, those mechanisms and the numbers involved uh, also matter for trying to figure out how well the vaccines are going to work uh, going forward. Not because the virus might escape, but if the virus is just a lot better at attaching to epithelial cells, then then it might be harder for antibodies to stop the virus from attaching to those epithelial cells. It, at some level, it's a competition. Um, and so uh, it is certainly really important to 
to, to gather more information on, on those topics uh, as, as quickly as possible now. Where it stands right now is um, the, they are variants of concern, um, uh, but really overall the antibody responses people make and the T-cell responses people make um, and the magnitude of those responses and the vaccine responses have generally looked good such that, it, that there's really not an expectation that any given viral variant would, would just escape the immune system of, uh, uh, of people in general. Um, and so that's why the statements by public health officials have generally still been, you know, pretty supportive and scientists in general have generally been supportive that, that it, the, the thought is the vaccines are going to continue to work against, against these variants. Um, uh, but the fact that they've got multiple mutations and are spreading so well in populations are, are reasons for concern and really trying to get uh, more immunological data as quickly as possible about them. And, and to clarify the, the testing that you're talking about to identify if these variants can escape the immune system um, or uh, the vaccine response, these are done in a test tube, right? I mean, they're taking blood samples from, from people and then measuring uh, that against the, these actual variants in, in a test tube? Correct. And, and those experiments are, are pretty easy to describe. You're really, um, the, the antibody uh, function is, is called neutralizing antibody, which is, you can basically just translate that as antibodies that are stopping the virus from infecting cells. So, so literally what you do is, is you, you'll mix the blood sample that has the antibodies um, from a given person with a small amount of virus and you let them sit together for an hour. And, and, and the antibodies, if they're there, will, will bind to the surface of all the viruses in the sample and it'll, they'll just cover up the virus and thereby keep the virus from infecting cells. So now you take that mixture and you put it on target cells and you ask, do those cells get infected um, and killed actually? Do the, do, does the virus then kill those target cells? And you can just look, you, you quantify the death of, of the cells um, and you can, do very good quantitations of that in, in a variety of ways. So yeah, it's literally, you take you take the antibodies from a person, you mix them with virus, and, and you ask, can that virus uh, still kill cells or, or not? It's called a neutralization assay. Interesting. I was shocked when I saw more and more scientists saying, yes, we think these new variants are may, do make the virus more transmissible than, than some of the original uh, variants of SARS-CoV-2. Um, it sounds like you, you agree with that. I mean, I've heard some reports it's 50% or, or more uh, transmissible potentially. So first question is, what are your thoughts on that? And second of all, how does that work? I'm trying to conceptualize this. I mean, this has been a global pandemic. This virus has spread to every country in the world and uh, millions and millions of cases. How, how does the virus get even more transmissible? Great question. So some of it gets into some epidemiology that is that is definitely not my expertise, right? And so the the estimates of 50% tra more transmissible um, or, or numbers higher or lower really come from epidemiological calculations about looking at how many cases there are, when and where, and comparing that with this strain versus a different strain, and comparing it in London versus suburbs or different parts in England, right? And, uh, and, and those are the numbers that they've come up with. They, they've certainly been done by multiple groups at this point, which is something that you always want to see in science, that, that multiple different people can look at the data, right, and come up with um, uh, uh, somewhat similar answers. Um, but I think even the people who have done that have said that they're not sure that those answers would be the same in a different population, right? It, it's definitely a more transmissible virus. What the what the numbers are to put on that may depend on uh, uh, on the population. Um, how ca how can that be? So the, the simplest concept is if if the virus can bind to its target cells better with higher affinity, uh, stronger binding, then it could be more transmissible because it's just as as you breathe in some virus, if if the virus is is more efficient at latching on to to its target surface. Um, you're, you're more likely to get an infection. And those mutations will occur in spike and in that RBD domain because that's the part of the virus that actually binds to target cells and, and infects them. But there are a number of different factors that could uh, could be changing in the virus that could affect transmissibility beyond uh, beyond that one. Some of them are immunological, um, some of them are not. Um, 
I think the the uh, the piece of data that I've seen that was most worrisome to me was, was a clinical lab in the UK putting a, out a preprint indicating that viral loads in nasal swabs from people are substantially higher in people infected with this variant than with the main strain. It's going to be really important to see that done by additional labs and, and, and done in, in different ways. It's the world's a complicated place and there are lots of different things to, to control for in science. Um, to me, that data looked quite compelling um, and they had it and it was something like 600 people, 600 samples that they were analyzing. And it was, you know, an official UK clinical lab looking at looking at their uh, their samples. But it was a there were big differences in viral load. And so if that's true, it's it would it would say that uh, this UK variant has has amassed a set of mutations that let it grow a lot better in in nasal passages than than the previous virus and that there's literally just a lot more virus um, in people's nose which then if if that's happening it's pretty easy to understand how that's more transmissible because you're just you're breathing more of it out right so if if there's just more uh, virus uh, coming out of you when you're breathing or sneezing or coughing, then then obviously it's, it's going to be more likely to be able to infect uh, people near you. Um, in the the previous main variant that swept the globe, it was it was something like a two to fourfold difference, uh, which was a substantial increase, and so that that was a pretty big um, bump. Um, but then this one, at least in this one piece of data, appears to be even more, which is definitely concerning. And so it's uh, uh, hopefully there'll be more data on it even in the next uh, week, hopefully, by other people looking at, at the same uh, types of data. But it's still quite plausible that, that that even if that is the case, that the vaccines will work uh, reasonably well against such a virus, because when you're already at 95%, you know, protective efficacy, that's a really high level. And so it's, it's, it's plausible that 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 will hold up reasonably well, even, even in the face of, of a virus that's uh, growing significantly more than, than, than the previous variant. Um, but there are lots of complexities and unknowns to that. There's, there's no, uh, there's no quick way to analyze that, that type of data. That's, that's really the type of thing that you, you just literally have to see how well does the vaccine actually protect people against, um, uh, against such a variant. I know there's no way for you or anyone else to predict what will happen, but um, it is a possibility that a vaccine, these RNA vaccines that have 95% effect- efficacy against disease at this point could drop below, say, even 50% um, if, there, if a variant has enough mutations involved. Well, let's just play with some numbers that are available, right? There's not there's very little data on this particular topic available and there's there's no clear reference point um, for comparison. But one piece of data, again, it's not definitive, but it's a piece, was that the, the Moderna vaccine was looking to be something like 67% effective against asymptomatic infections um, in, in the clinical trial, okay? So so protection is, is a gradient, right? So at, at one extreme of protection, you've got sterilizing immunity, um, where you just don't get infected at all. Um, and then next along that gradient would be some very truncated infection, maybe just a couple of days that you don't notice. And then um, a, a longer gradient would be, I think, what people would generally be calling asymptomatic infection, you know, that you're infected for some period of time, maybe even a week, um, but you never notice it. You never felt sick. You just, you, you got a test for some reason and it turned out the test was positive and maybe you have a substantial amount of virus, but you weren't getting sick, right? And and then next on the gradient are, are really symptomatic COVID and then hospitalized COVID and then ICU COVID, right? And then, and then fatality. And so uh, protection is a gradient along, uh, immunological protection is a gradient along along that whole, that whole spectrum. Um, and protection against protection preventing asymptomatic infection is is probably indicating right, you've really got what we would call sterilizing immunity or just a, a really short asymptomatic infection of, of, a, of, of a couple of days. Um, and so if you have a vaccine that's giving you 95% protection against, against symptomatic disease and 
let's just be simple and we'll call it 70% just to give a simple number. Um, 70% against uh, asymptomatic, um, that 70% protection is, is probably, st it's sterilizing or very close to sterilizing, okay? So now you apply, now if we apply a new viral variant to that picture and ask, how's it gonna do against the new viral variant? And there are two general categories that we're trying to deal with, right? Thinking about the viral variants is, uh, is it specifically evading a, a specific aspect of the immune system, right? The computer, is it, is it, is it just the specific recognition that's being shifted or is it, there's just more virus in general that it's so it's tougher to protect against, right? So, uh, so let's. I think we already talked about kind of the specific variant thing, but the more virus in general. So if, if you've got 70% sterilizing immunity, and now you're faced with a new virus that has just more virus around, uh, you, you're not going to have 70% sterilizing immunity anymore. That's 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 unlikely. That's going to drop. Um, uh, some and, and maybe uh, and maybe a lot, um, but then there's still a pretty big window there on that on that gradient of protective immunity that you might not be able to you might no longer be stopping the virus from getting in and infecting you at all. But once you get infected, you have all these other weapons of the immune system, right? You've got the memory B cells, you've got the the memory helper T cells, memory killer T cells that all then have an opportunity to try and shut down that virus within, let's say, five to seven days before it actually makes you sick. So certainly you'd have less protection against infection at all, but protection against symptomatic disease, it, it, it might not drop very much because your immune system is an exponential process. Um, and so uh, and, and these vaccines are inducing a lot of different components of, of the immune system. So uh, given that there's a decent window of time before people show symptomatic disease, um, yeah, the immune system might do a decent job at, uh, at dealing with variants, even if it can't prevent uh, infection. Per se. And again, the, the T cells are definitely recognizing all kinds of different parts of the virus. So, so we don't really expect variants matter at all for that. And interestingly, while we talk about variants escaping antibodies, you know, when we said, well, the point of memory B cells is to make more of those antibodies when you get infected. So if you didn't have enough antibody at the start, once you get infected, well, now you make more antibodies to try and uh, stop the virus. But uh, that, that's actually only part of the story with memory B cells. Um, and uh, one of the cool things about memory B cells is your immune system makes uh, a library of, of memory B cells, makes a range of memory B cells. They don't all look the same. Um, and and the, the leading concept is that the memory B cells are a library of essentially guesses of what types of viral variants might occur so that if you do get infected, well, maybe you got infected because you just didn't quite have enough antibody, but maybe you got infected because actually the virus looks a little different. So the antibodies that you had circulating weren't the right ones, but you have memory B cells that are uh, that mutated themselves um, and, and, and all looked a little bit different. And so any memory B cells that can recognize the new variant that you've already got a lot of those, and so it's still a lot better than starting um, uh, uh, from scratch. So the variants are definitely a concern. I mean, if if, if nothing else, they they're certainly infecting more people, right? And and certainly in the absence of, of vaccines, um, uh, the variants are going to make more people sick, and and more people um, uh, will die because of these variants, because they they are they are spreading more. Certainly, they make it even more important uh, to to wear a mask well and do social distancing well because I mean, if if the virus is more transmissible and if there is more virus around, it makes it all the more important to to limit your exposure to it. Um, but also to get as many people vaccinated as quickly as possible to limit the the spread of the virus. That, based on all the available data we 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 have, that that still looks like the best path forward. Um, and I don't know if you want to talk about the, the ideas about uh, changes in vaccines or whatnot. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, that, that's, um, I think you mentioned there's a bit of almost chaos um, at, at this time because the UK has a strategy with their vaccine that they've discussed at this time of trying to vaccinate really as many people as possible with one dose before coming around with a second dose, from my understanding. And uh, some U.S. officials have considered that strategy as well. Um, so, yeah, what are your thoughts on that? And then also this discussion 
uh, again among officials of potentially giving out a half dose of these RNA vaccines as opposed to a full dose. Those are decisions being made or decisions being discussed and, and some of them in, the, in, in America it's at multiple different levels of government, right? Because some of these decisions are, can even be made uh, uh, locally. Um, and it is, the, there is, there is some chaos uh, on, on, on that topic right now. Um, it's, those decisions are largely being driven right now by, given how bad the cases are, can we, can we save more lives and or blunt transmissions better by, by doing something different with the vaccine? And, and, and the UK really took the pretty extreme decision of, of uh, not following the vaccine uh, schedule that, that, that was proven in, in the phase three trial. Um, and there, there are a couple of different ways that's being described. And I think we'll have to kind of see how it, how it plays out. One simple notion was to say, all right, we're just, just vaccinate everybody you can with one dose right now and, and not really worry about when the second dose would be delivered. And so if the second dose gets delivered, at three weeks or four weeks or five weeks or six weeks, fine. That's probably all close enough to be pretty much the same. Um, and it's just a logistics thing of trying to immunize as many people as possible, uh, as quickly as possible, uh, without knowing exactly when they'll get that that second immunization, the booster immunization. Um, and I think that's uh, quite reasonable in the sense that uh, whether someone gets that second immunization at three weeks, four weeks, five weeks, six weeks, or, or even at 12 weeks, um, their amount of protective immunity out at six months um, is probably going to be the same, um, independent of exactly which week they got immunized. Uh, and there are certainly vaccination schedules and, and experimental studies that have found uh, delaying the immunization can be even better uh, six months out. You know that that uh, that the way immune memory works, having a delay in there can totally be beneficial. None of that's been proven with these vaccines, right? Well, we know with these vaccines, if you immunize at day zero, and uh, uh, and, and day twenty one or day twenty eight, they work fantastically well, ninety five percent protection. Um, it, it seems more what the UK is saying is immunize it day one and then week 12 with the idea that one immunization is good enough for protective immunity, a lot of protective immunity, probably for that 12 week period. Um, and that's a real stretch, um, based on, based on the available data, which is, which is, which is why I refer to it as a, as a pretty extreme, uh, decision, certainly a decision one would not make in normal times when would only even consider it under sort of, you know, an emergency, which is, which is what they've, which is what they've done. As far as I can tell, that decision is being based on two things. One is that when one looks at the, the Pfizer vaccine clinical trial data or the Moderna clinical trial data, and, and the two companies have, have both reported these, these data as well, that, that there is measurable protection after one immunization. Um, and so that's, that's interesting. That's a good sign. Um, and in fact, that, that 67% protection that I referred to, right, for the Moderna, for the asymptomatic, that, that's all after one immunization. Cause the way they found that was at the day of the second immunization, they did a test. And so any, any of that protection was, was occurring from the first immunization. So by multiple metrics, there's some protection after the first immunization. There are two big questions. One is how much of that protection, how much is that protection? And then how long does that protection last? And the back of the envelope calculations that people have, have done is that it's 90% protection uh, or, or more. Um, but it's based on this really narrow window of time. It's, it's the time between that day one and then the day 21 or day 28, right? That, that's it, because that's the only time window that was in those phase three clinical trials for having only one immunization. The, if you want, 
it's a very good thing to test whether one immunization can be protective. But the way you would do it is you would immunize some people with just one immunization, and then you would just you, you would wait and watch, right, and, and let it let it go the, the the six months. That that wasn't done. There's just like this couple week week period um, to see an effect, and that's not what the trials were designed to test. And there wasn't follow up. So I. I think it's entirely possible that that protection literally lasts for a couple of weeks and then it fades away. Um, and, and that would be your nightmare scenario that you've, uh, you've decided to immunize people 12 weeks apart and hope that they'd be protected for that period of time. But instead they're just protected for a couple of weeks of that. Um, and, and, you know, and not the bulk of it and you really haven't gained yourself. And what they're hoping for is that, it is this 90% protection and then it stays something like that. And I think they've even had people say that they're hoping that maybe it's like 80% protection over that, you know, uh, 12 weeks. And then, and then the booster immunization kicks in and it goes up to 95% protection. And there's just, there, there's, there's, there's very little information to actually support that. Immunologically, it's a reasonable concept, but vaccines, we, you know, we hold vaccines to a, to a high bar of showing that they've, they've, uh, they work. So the American FDA responded to this yesterday with, with a press release that said you should not give these vaccines except for on the recommended schedule because there, there isn't data supporting um, just one immunization or spacing them out uh, 12 weeks. They did state, look, uh, they, they, you know, they said, in, in their own way. Look, if you get an immunization at day one and, and can't manage to pull it off at four weeks and instead, you know, you had to delay it till six weeks, sure, go ahead and still give it at six weeks. Uh, and that's a normal thing with any vaccine regimen. If you're if you're a, a little early or uh, or a couple weeks late, um, that's, that, that's all fine. Uh, but betting that one immunization is providing a lot of, of protection um, really isn't warranted from from the data that are are available for for the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines, and and and, and Pfizer and Moderna, right, have both said, well, we, <laughs> I mean, they've said very little, right, but one of the things they've said is essentially, well, <laughs> we ran these phase three clinical trials to show that the vaccine would work if you take it the way we say you should take it. Uh, beyond that, uh, there, there's there's not a lot. To, uh, to go on. So then the other consider the other idea that that's that's been floated in the US was well okay and instead of that what if you go with a half dose so instead of uh, you give the vaccine on the same time frame but you go with a half dose um, and at least for the Moderna vaccine they did have a clinical trial where they gave people half dose um, and the immune responses in the people who got the half dose um, were about the same as the immune responses in people who got the whole dose. So from an immunogenicity perspective, um, that, that concept is, is supported. Um, but that wasn't a phase three clinical trial. That wasn't, a, that wasn't a clinical trial that tested protection. That was a clinical trial that just tested immunogenicity. Did people make an immune response? So there's no direct demonstration that the half dose protects people. Um, it's a reasonable inference that it would protect people because it, it was basically the same immune response um, over over a short window of time. Um, but the normal bar we hold vaccines to is, is you know, show that it actually works in a, in a, in a phase three, even for, for emergency use. Um, and it's possible that the half dose wouldn't generate, you know, as much memory as the full dose. Uh, that being said, the half dose was given to several hundred people. Um, so it was a pretty big study and it really did look non-inferior to, to the full dose. So if somebody told me that under an emergency situation that they were just going to change it and everybody was going to get a half dose because it was important to immunize twice as many people, um, I, I could certainly understand that decision process because uh, there's no safety concern with it, and you've got immunogenicity data to at least support that, that that you would expect a reasonable amount of protection 
But honestly, at the moment, it's looked like the biggest problems, at least in the U.S., are, are, are not actually the available doses, but just the logistics of immunizing people, right? That, that, that in California, is something like only 35% of the doses have been given. So the problem isn't that we need to <laughs> space them out or give half a dose. We just got to use the doses that are there. Uh, so I, I certainly don't mind people having conversations about changing vaccine dose or, or regimen, but uh, trust in the vaccines is a very important aspect as well, you know, and, and uh, these two vaccines have like 95% eff efficacy if you give them properly. So, you know, really, uh, I'm with the FDA that you should give the vaccines properly and you should give them a lot faster than we're giving them right now. And, and, and that's the best path. That's the best path forward for, for January. You mentioned that a potential downside of either giving a half dose or just one dose as opposed to two is that maybe you don't have the same immunity that was demonstrated in those clinical trials. Are there other downsides of, you know, again, doing something like the UK is considering doing uh, with just the one dose and spacing out that second dose, could it put uh, a different type of pressure on this virus to mutate? Is that, is that another potential? Yeah, it really, yeah, it is. Yeah, I mean, my PhD is in is in virology, so I definitely think about a bunch of these things sort of from the virus perspective, right, from time, from time to time. And and I very much agree with comments that I've seen people put out, and I've, I've made similar comments in private that gee, if you really wanted to drive virus escape mutations, you would do it in a partially immune population so that there was some immunity around, but not enough to squish the virus, just enough to, to injure it, but give it time and opportunity to mutate and become become resistant. You know, that's, I mean, that's basically the, the old recipe for how you get antibiotic resistant bacteria. Um, and certainly in labs, that's exactly what you do to get, um, uh, 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 resistant viruses to, to drugs to, to study you know how, how viruses evolve you, you you don't you don't want situations with with low grade immunity you, you 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 want the maximum immunity you can get and just and crush the virus so that you know that it stopped and the virus has no chance to uh, to escape so yeah uh, I am very much in agreement that that's uh, that's a concern, which is also my opinion on, on convalescent plasma treatments. Um, uh, uh, I, I really don't see any reason why anybody should be using convalescent plasma in patients at this point. They're, they're monoclonal antibody treatments that are uh, highly potent, and, and so you either give those or, or, or nothing at all, I would say, because the convalescent plasma has this really low antibody titer. Um, and they, as far as I can tell, they really don't work in people. So if anything, you're just giving a bit of antibody into a person that has a ton of virus, and you're potentially just driving escape mutations in in, in these people. You're, you're you're turning them into um, you know virus mutation experiments, which is really not what anybody needs. Um, yeah. It's, I mean, that's, that's a concern that that's sort of one way that the UK variant could have emerged, basically, is that it was a virus that was growing in an immunocompromised person for, for a long period of time. So it's just a person who had a lot of virus for a long time and, that, and some sort of partial immunity. Well, Professor Crotty, thanks again for joining us today. And again, I hope everyone will go back and watch our previous discussion. Um, a lot was said there about uh, how these RNA vaccines work. And... Uh, What's what's next for you and your team, Professor? I think clearly there's still a lot more to learn about uh, about immune memory um, to the virus, and so we're gonna we're gonna keep studying um, immune memory and and directly studying the immune responses people make to to these vaccines um, because this yeah this virus is not is not gonna go away um, uh, overnight. Um, and I will say broadly on the horizon beyond beyond just us, I think. Uh, uh, there is another vaccine trial, right? That's the, uh, um, that's expected to have results uh, this next month, and so people are very interested in that one. And that's that's the J and J um, clinical trial, which is another adenoviral. Um, so that's um, yeah, something to keep an eye out for. Excellent. Well, thanks again for joining us. Appreciate it. 
Thanks, Kyle.